somebody domesticated them. And who's that somebody? It's obviously themselves. So now I'm going to sh little do a shift here and, uh, and talk about what we know about the evolution of reduced reactive aggression, the reduced propensity to lose your temper when somebody insults your mother. And I'm introducing the famous experiment by the uh, Russian biologist Dmitry Belyev, who in the 1950s started selecting foxes on the basis of reduced reactive aggression. So here's what he did. He took foxes, just like uh, you know, the red foxes here, that there's a slightly black version that uh, occurs in, in Canada. Uh, they'd been in Russia for 50 years, breeding without anyone deliberately um, selecting them. And so what Belyev did was to arrange for people to walk towards the young foxes when they were something like six weeks old. And uh, at the point that the young fox said, ah! then they would write down, well, how far was that? And they would breed from the ones who got closest, who allowed the human to get closest. And within a few years, in sometimes three years, sometimes five years, sometimes 10 years, different aspects of uh, features that are found in domesticated animals suddenly appeared, such as these white patches. Doesn't look much like a fox anymore, does it? It looks like Fido. Floppy ears. You probably remember that there's only one animal in the wild that has floppy ears, or one kind, and that's elephants. Floppy ears are characteristic of our friendliest dogs. So these are examples of features of the domestication syndrome. And what we're seeing here is evidence that you select against reactive aggression, and then, boom, magic, you get these features of the domestication syndrome, which is why goats and horses and cows and cats and dogs all have individuals that have got white patches of fur on them. And floppy ears occur in all of these animals too. So that was a remarkable discovery, and it means we can now reverse engineer, as it were, and go backwards and say, okay, if you show a self-domestication syndrome, or if you show a domestication syndrome, that means that there was selection against reactive aggression. And fascinatingly, Homo sapiens, that's you and me, or most of us anyway, I think here, has key features of domesticated species as determined by archaeologists. So archaeologists working in the range of, say, five to 10,000 years quite often find an animal, animal bones, and they want to know, was this a domesticated species or was it a wild version? Was it a, a wolf or was it already a dog by this time? So they look at the bones and they say, well, okay, how do we tell? And here's how they tell. Lighter body, shorter face, smaller teeth, feminization of the skull and skeleton, and uh, brain reduction. And guess what? Homo sapiens shows all of these features in relationship to our earlier ancestors. They don't all emerge at the same time. Short face and small teeth are some of the things that happen the very earliest moment. Uh, brain reduction only in the last 30,000 years. But it's an amazing th thought that uh, our brains are about 10 to 14 percent smaller than uh, the, uh, those of our ancestors 30,000 years ago. And then these, these domestication-like traits, and there are special ones in humans, uh, increase through time. So the, the brow ridge is getting lighter as we come closer to the future. Any big brow ridges? Um, and, and the face gets narrower. Uh, and uh, in some of these cases, we don't actually know what this means in terms of aggression. This is totally amazing. So this is a, play, a picture of people playing hockey. That is ice hockey, which is what they, they call hockey in the States. And um, uh, this guy has had his, his head measured so uh, uh, to look at the width of the face in relationship to the, the length of the face, or, or the height of the face. And the reason we're looking at uh, hockey players is because in hockey, if you get into a fight, then the ref puts you into the penalty box. So you can ask, well, how long do people spend in the penalty box in relationship to the width of their face? And the answer is that the wider your face, then the more time you spend in the penalty box. And it <laughs> doesn't seem likely that there are any sort of s some subtle biases that have caused people to, uh, to have that relationship. And I want to point out that none of these relationships is, is individually statistically significant. But this is six different teams of professional players in which uh, the trend is there. And if you look at college players, you get exactly the same thing. 
that is not individually significant but, uh, in, in each team, it would be if you did it for long enough, but it is always consistent. And this is one of an example of many different um, studies looking at the relationship between facial width in men and aggressiveness, dominance, um, and uh, motivation to succeed. And, and there are now investment firms that are, are glommed onto this and realize that uh, you get invest different investment strategies by men according to the breadth of their face. Uh, and uh, they're now dealing with the ethical problems of, uh, of how to uh, build that into the assignments and so on. Um, okay, third point. So, so w w the second point was that uh, we got these features that are characteristic of sapiens that have been increasingly uh, increased over time, the domestication features. And uh, we can compare with uh, various other species of Homo. And Homo sapiens is the only one that has these domestication features. So, for instance, the breadth of the face. Uh, here it is in Neanderthals, uh, wider than in humans. And here it is in Denisovans, the uh, uh, Asian uh, populations of, of Homo, where they've had to reconstruct it based on the genes, uh, which are, they understand quite a lot about the way that methylation of genes uh, is associated with uh, the breadth of the face. So you might think then that we could start looking at the genetics and see whether or not we share the gen genes for domestication with animals. And it turns out that we do. So people are beginning to get the domestication genes sorted out. You know, you've all these similarities in different domesticated lines, such as the white patches and the floppy ears that I mentioned. And so you think there should be some some commonality in the genes, and uh, when you look at the differences between uh, dogs and wolves, uh, then it turns out that some of those are in common genetically with the differences between uh, domesticated horses and uh, the wilder horses. Uh, same with cats and cows. And then you take all of those genes, and you say, okay, are they similar to the differences between sapiens and Neanderthals or Denisovans? And the answer is yes. Are the Domestication genes that we have in common with these domesticated animals are not found in the Neanderthals and Denisovans. So that means that prior to uh, this sort of time, uh, half a million to almost a quarter of a million years ago, uh, which is when we split with Neanderthals and Denisovans, uh, there would have been something different going on genetically. So what this suggests is that in Homo sapiens, we've had selection against reactive aggression, which is not applied to these other species that don't show any evidence of domestication or uh, loss of reactive aggression. And I'm now going to draw your attention to what happens to uh, alpha males. Okay, so the summary of the section we just looked at here is that um, uh, if you think about the time since four million years ago up to the present, Homo sapiens emerges something like 300,000 years ago, the very earliest intimations of it from fossils in Morocco. And the differences that we see there are like those found in domesticated animals, and that means somebody domesticated them. And who's that somebody? It's obviously themselves. So that's what we call self-domestication. So why did it happen? How come we're all such wonderfully self-domesticated and polite individuals that nobody's had a fight in here yet? Well done. Okay, so low reactive aggression, according to the bone evidence and the tooth evidence and the genetic evidence, began around 300,000 years ago or was manifest by then. So why did it happen? So all non-human primates have a thing called alpha males. And you might think that we do, but I'm going to argue that we don't. So the alpha is a male who is on top of the hierarchy, the dominance hierarchy, of fighting ability. And he uses his reactive aggression, which we've already seen is a lot more elevated than in humans, to respond to any challenges. And that really works well because it maintains his position as the alpha male. And guess what? He ends up evolutionarily successful because all alpha males tend to do very well in terms of the critical currency of evolution high paternity, fathering lots of kids. So this is true for chimpanzees, it's true for gorillas, and it's true for bonobos. I'm going to say that Homo sapiens does not have alpha males because 
the leaders, let's call them leaders, not alphas, they lead by consensus. Uh, Donald Trump cannot personally bring down in a barroom fight uh, all of the people that he wants to, to dominate. He relies on having supporters, and that is true for all human groups. Uh, it means that uh, the um, actual leader uh, need not be the dominant gender in the group, so we can have women who can be uh, leaders, uh, we can have uh, all sorts of people, you know, three-year-old boys being leaders. Um, so the important thing is that they are not uh, fighting in terms of uh, their own personal ability to dominate others one-on-one. -on -one. All right, so somehow we lost alpha males. And my question now is, what is it that selected against being an alpha male? It's not an easy problem to answer because we've seen alpha males get evolutionary benefit by being an alpha male. They dominate access to the paternity. That doesn't happen with our leaders, thank God. <laughs> Nowadays, if you have somebody who is seriously violent, then we have ways of dealing with them using a sort of somewhat chimpanzee-like system of an imbalance of power, so, you know, five policemen come to your door and can carry you away. But what they do with you is take you to a prison. And we have to think ourselves back to a time when prisons did not exist. Then what did you do about someone who was seriously violent? And the answer is, you executed them. To continue watching this video, click the link in the top left or in the description below. Or visit iai.tv for more debates and talks from the world's leading thinkers on today's biggest ideas.